morning. <laughs> it's great to be here and such a privilege. I know that's something guest speakers sort of have to say, but it's true. I love this church. Uh, it's such a privilege to be back visiting with you this morning. I know uh, you guys are the real holy rollers this morning because you've sacrificed the rugby to be here with Jesus and this church. And so it's a privilege to be with you. As Dennis said, my name's Dave. And I'm just so thankful to have this opportunity to share with you this morning, uh, to open God's word for us. I trust it's going to be encouraging. Um, I'll be with uh, you over the next two weeks and uh, just opening up God's word, what I feel God has laid on my heart for us. And maybe even a bit uh, self-indulgently, it's, it's also for me, I'm going to be speaking about prayer because I know this is an area I need growth. And if you're anything like me, I know this is an area maybe you need growth as well. So what comes to your mind when you think about prayer? Maybe you think about meditation and, and reflection and being silent, being still. Uh, maybe you think of uh, uh, more active things like, like asking and enjoying and rejoicing and uh, warfare, missions, spiritual power, whatever it is. Uh, prayer is, is all these things and so much more. And so maybe the most important question I can ask you this morning is simply this, how is your prayer life? Whether you're, you're a new Christian or, or maybe you're not even Christian yet, or you've been Christian for many, many years, how is your prayer life? How we're doing in prayer is just so important to our own walk with Jesus and our own uh, joy. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, of all the blessings of Christian salvation, None is greater than this, that we have access to God in prayer. Now, of course, we love the Bible too. We love singing. We love uh, other spiritual disciplines, but there's nothing quite like prayer. And I agree, Martin Lloyd-Jones is correct. Uh, there are just some things we only learn and experience about God through prayer. And yet far too often, this is a spiritual discipline that we neglect. Uh, we all struggle with prayer. Sometimes we are prone to believe that it's unproductive and that there is a better use of our time. Maybe you've uh, found yourself at times thinking that it's ineffective, that we should rather be doing something, getting active, getting busy, because prayer is, of course, not work, right? We need to do something. Well, I want to challenge that through God's word. May maybe you are new to faith and, and you think prayer is a bit like, is a bit immature, like it's us speaking to an imaginary friend in the sky. Maybe you find prayer just simply boring or intimidating. Maybe you feel that you don't know how to pray. I think there's just such tremendous blessing through prayer. And my main contentions over the next two weeks is that some of the reasons we don't pray isn't that we're, we're too too um, busy with more important things, but that we are too distracted and consumed with less important things. It's not that we're too tired to pray, but too lazy to pray. Uh, and so we, we feel too busy to pray, and so we're too busy to have power in us. We can understand why Paul says that we need to pray without ceasing. There's just such blessing in prayer. Martin Luther a bit tongue-in-cheek, he said he's too busy not to pray. He says that he's got so much to do today that if he doesn't start the day off for three hours of prayer, he'll never get it all done. Of course, a bit of hyperbole there, a bit of exaggeration, but you get the point. There's just something about prayer that um, invites God's power to do what only he can do. We can be busy and active and working hard and, and looking productive, but we need God to do what only he can do. That's where prayer is so powerful. So we're going to be looking at prayer the next two weeks. Uh, today we're going to be dealing with the section of Scripture that comes just before the Lord's Prayer, and then next week we'll be looking at into the Lord's Prayer, and I've called this series Sync because I truly believe that prayer is God's invitation to us as his people to get in sync with him, to, to embrace our Father in a way that no other spiritual discipline can really quite do the same thing. 
Prayer is how we sync with God's heart and God's power for us and for other people. It's, a tr- it's an amazing blessing to pray for other people. That's why Charles Spurgeon said that no one can do a greater kindness in this life than to pray for me. And so I'm just gonna be um, challenging us and encouraging us that as we grow I- I- in prayer, that we just to see it for what it is. It's, it's an amazing thing. Prayer too often for us becomes a formality uh, or, or just a non-existent thing in our lives. But really it is the key to abundant joy. It is the key to abiding. It is the key to flourishing as a believer. So I ask you again, how is your prayer life? And I'm trusting that God would help us take just another step in growing uh, in this way and, and experiencing some of the blessing that is ours through prayer and through spending that time communi- communicating and communing with our Father in heaven. So would you grab a Bible and ch- turn to uh, Matthew chapter 6? If you're using the Bible in front of you, it's in the New Testament on, on page 5. And uh, maybe as we turn there, I just want to ask you to consider just a moment of reflection. If there's anything that is particularly weighing on your heart this morning, just acknowledge what it is. It might be that you have a personal need or a relational need or, or maybe you're praying for REC in this exciting season. God loves honest prayers and so he's calling us in to acknowledge the things of of our heart that we need to pour out into him as we cry out to him in prayer. So Matthew chapter six, I'll be reading from verse five. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Amen. What an amazing piece of scripture. As I said, we'll be dealing with the Lord's Prayer next week, but today we're just looking at verses five to eight. And Jesus in this portion of scripture is challenging false prayer, fake prayer. Prayer that appears and has a veneer of uh, authenticity about it, but he calls it fake prayer. He calls it uh, hi- hypocritical prayer. And uh, we'll explain, I'll explain why a bit later, but this morning we're gonna be looking at some of the marks of an authentic prayer life and what it means to truly pray as we pray to our Father in heaven. Um, and as I was prepping for this, I was reminded of a, of of an experience I had about seven or eight years ago uh, when I was part of the RUC family. Uh, We had an opportunity to go on a missions trip to Thailand and we were joining a RUC, a a missionary couple down in the south of Thailand who are part of RUC. Um, And uh, on our way there, we had a one day stopover in Bangkok. So it was a free day and we we spent the day um, touring the city, just, you know, exploring it, just getting a feel for the culture, for the food, visiting some temples. Uh, It's an amazing city. Uh, And one thing we were told you have to do by friends who had visited Bangkok is that you have to go to this uh, amazing place called the MBK Center. Now the MBK Center, uh, truth be told, is just a shopping center but it's so much more than that. It's like a China mall on steroids. 
It's got amazing stuff there. And now look, personally, I hate shopping, but I really love a good deal. So this place was right up my alley. So we decided to um, stockpile some of the things we needed to take back home. I was students, so we didn't buy too much, and we didn't have too much space in our luggage, obviously, but I decided to buy some clothes. Um, I didn't have many. Uh, for the trip, so I decided to go uh, around all the different shops, the clothing shops, and select uh, different items. And I came back with uh, Calvin Klein underpants, and I had diesel jeans, and I had a Nike shirt, uh, I had Ray-Ban sunglasses, and um, Javiana sl- uh, slip slops, I even bought a, a tag watch. And uh, all the shop owners assured me that these were not fake. These, uh, th- these, were, these were genuine fake. These were genuine facts. They, they were the real deal. Now, of course, I'm standing there looking like the real deal. Name brands head to toe. Looking authentic, looking convincing. But there is nothing genuine in this. It's completely fake. It looks the real deal, but it's a sham. And I'm just a poser, ultimately. And that is exactly what Jesus is saying about this kind of hypocritical prayer that we'll unpack a bit later, is that there's a way we can pray that is just inauthentic, not true prayer. And he's inviting us to avoid that and to enter into the blessing of true prayer as we commune and communicate with our Father. So Jesus is calling us to be aware of praying for show, And to avoid this as he invites us into genuine prayer. To be set free from pretending and performing. And to enter into the blessing of genuine prayer with our Father. So we're going to look at four marks of an authentic prayer life in uh, this portion of scripture. And the first one, uh, Jesus, before he gets to criticizing the hypocrites and the pagans, he actually starts off by acknowledging that the one thing that they're doing right, and this is the first mark of an authentic prayer life, he says that it needs to be regular. A, a regular, a healthy prayer life is always a regular prayer life. And so Jesus starts with that phrase, when you pray, and he repeats it in verse 5 and verse 6, And verse seven, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. Not if you pray, but when you pray. Jesus is assuming prayer. And I think he's doing this for for, for two reasons. The first is that given his context, he was speaking to religious Jews, uh, devout Jews, who had a routine uh, and habit of praying at least three times a day. At nine, at 12, and at three, they would stop what they're doing, they'd bring out their scripture book, and they'd read scripture and pray for a few minutes, and then they'd carry on with their day. This was a habit. It, it happened every day, it was widespread. Everyone did this, or at least the devout people did this. And Jesus is saying there is nothing wrong with that routine. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the discipline and routine of regular prayer. He's not confronting the frequency of their prayers. When he gets to it, he's talking about the hollowness of their prayers, that it was just routine, that they were just going through the motions. There was nothing genuine about it. But as for the frequency, there was, that's a great thing. Regular prayer is brilliant. And maybe we can ask us a, a, a question. What would drive you to regular prayer? What would drive me to praying often? Of course, the one thing is just routine and having a discipline, but it's got to be so much more than that. Because if all we have is the discipline of praying regularly, if it's just a routine, very quickly it'll become hollow and empty. And so I think what Jesus is pointing us to is to a realization of our need for God. That when we become more and more aware of how much we need him, that would, of course, drive us to run to him. And we express that through prayer. Praying often is brilliant, but like he's confronting here, regular prayers that are empty is worth nothing. But when we realize our need and we run to him, 
with needy hearts to our Father and express that need, that's where the gold is found. And, and that's what Jesus is really saying here. He's saying that we're too quick to settle for lesser things and to get our priorities mixed up. Really, this is an issue of belief. When we avoid prayer or neglect prayer, which we all do, and we choose to do other things instead of praying, what we're saying is, what we're believing is that those things are more important to us than our need for God. And so we're running to them. It's more immediate, it's more urgent, it's more necessary. We need it more. And so we run to other things. But Jesus is, is confronting that and he's saying, no, when you pray, guys, you need to pray because you need God. We will never outgrow our need for God. We are needy people. We will never outgrow our need for the gospel and we'll never outgrow our need for the spirit. We'll never outgrow our need for grace and new morning mercy. We'll never outgrow our need for God's providence. Everything, everything in our lives, everything we have and everything we need comes from the gracious hand of our Father. And our problem then, if we avoid prayer or neglect prayer or don't pray as much as we should, is that we forget how needy we are. And the truth, friends, is that we are just not as self-sufficient as we tend to think. We're not, as, we're not gifted enough, we're not successful enough, we're not strategic enough, and we're not wise enough to know what we need. Yet, we have a Father who knows exactly what we need and invites us in to pray. The truth is, friends, that we need to pray more than we are ever aware and at the same time, the beautiful truth is that our Father is available to us more than we have ever imagined. Isn't that amazing? We have a great need for God, and yes, we have an amazing, unending God for all of our needs. And so Jesus is calling us to remember our need for him. That through prayer, we get to talk to God and we get to hear God, and we get to repent and receive forgiveness, and we get to experience grace, and we get to receive spiritual power, and we get to express our needs, and we get to partner with God in what he's doing in other people's lives as we pray for them. Simply put, prayer is how we sync with God's will and God's work. It's how we embrace our Father. If you're a Christian, we've admitted that we don't pray maybe as much as we should, but prayer is to the Christian what air is to breathing and life. It should just flow out of us because we're the king's kids. It's the ultimate expression of our adoption as his children. Uh, Dennis prayed earlier uh, for, for my daughter. She's 16 months, nearly 17 months, and, and she's at that stage where now she's just shouting, Dad, Dad, wherever. She doesn't care where I am. She'll just shout. In the shopping mall, uh, other week at, at church, she shouted that in the middle of, of a preach. It's amazing. There's just this confidence to run to, to Dad and to shout, Dad, Dad, I'm here. Dad, where are you? Dad, come to me. That's the invitation we have as God's children. Can we shout dad together? Dad, he loves to hear our prayers. He loves to hear our prayers. The second thing Jesus says about the mark of an authentic prayer life is that this should be obvious, that it needs to be Godward, Godward prayer. The motive of our hearts when we pray should be to speak to God, right? That should be obvious, but our motives aren't always so pure. See what Jesus says in verse five. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full, that being the praise of others. So Jesus' criticism here is very clear. The reason they pray is to be seen by others. 
And that's why he calls them hypocrites. Now that word hypocrites is a very interesting word. It's the word used for actors uh, who, who uh, are actors in theaters, who dress in, in clothes and wear masks, and it's a bit of play acting. That's, that's the imagery here. Jesus is saying that this is a, a performance. It's not a prayer, it's a performance. Jesus is saying it, it's for show, it's pretend. It's not a real prayer. It's hypocritical because it's just a performance to impress those around you. It's not a real prayer because it's not directed at God. It's directed horizontally to impress people. Now these, these guys Jesus is speaking about, these hypocrites, these Pharisees, they would pray three times a day and they would make it a scene. Now they were, they were very good at this. They went to public places. It says they went to synagogues and street corners. Now this is marketing 101, right? If you wanna be seen by others, you need high visibility. And that's what they were doing here. They were very good at this. They would pray loudly and they would put on a show. And Jesus diagnoses the issue. He says that they're doing it to be seen by others. That's their motivation. They want people to notice them and think well of them. They want to earn respect and love and admiration. They want to win the approval of people. Their motive has got nothing to do with God. It's about themselves and what they can gain by praying impressive prayers. Jesus is calling that fake prayer. He says it's acting, it's performing. Now before we point fingers at these Pharisees, let's admit this is in each one of us at times. We're far too prone to think about how we can maximize our impressiveness or or we're just too aware of who's around us when we pray and how that needs to shape the words we use. Uh, may, maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, Dave, that's not my issue. My issue isn't thinking about how impressively I can pray. My issue is plucking up the courage to just pray in public. And I acknowledge that. There's, there's different faith stages among us. But I, th- I think it would be good for us to just remember here that both of these things have roots in the same place. Praying to impress people and being too too scared to pray in front of people are both rooted in an uh, uh, over-concern in what people will think. One is is rooted in trying to earn favor, the other is is rooted in not trying to lose any more favor. They're both concerned with what people will think of you. We all do this. And what Jesus is saying is that when this fear of man infiltrates our prayer life, it will kill our joy. And it'll kill us spiritually, slowly, but it will corrupt us. Especially when we pray in public. Jesus is telling us to forget who's around you and focus on the direction of your prayer. It doesn't matter how impressive it is or or not. He just wants you to pray to him. He wants you to engage him as your father. Friends, there is a difference between praying to God in the presence of people and praying to people in the presence of God. Are our prayers horizontal or are they vertical? This is what Jesus is saying. Are we praying to impress? Or are we too scared because of fear of man, those are fear of man things. We need to be praying because we wanna engage our Father in heaven who absolutely loves us. He wants us to focus on the, the direction of our prayers. And so often this is about whose attention we're going after. God, we want your attention as our Father. Your attention is on us. We're reciprocating, we're running to you, we're shouting, Dad! We wanna engage you as our Father. The third thing Jesus says about authentic prayer is that it's primarily done in secret. See, so he's, not, he's not saying it's always done in secret. Public prayer is brilliant. Praying together is one of the marks of a healthy church. Jesus is not going after public prayer. He's going after fake prayer. But, but now what he says is very interesting. He's just said that we shouldn't uh, pray in synagogues and street corners to be seen by people. And now he says we should rather go into our room, close the door, and pray where only God can see us. 
This, friends, of course, is both descriptive and prescriptive. prescriptive. Let's just read the verse, verse six. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Right, descriptively, he's contrasting hypocritical public prayer with authentic private prayer, but I think, like I said, it's more than that. I think this is prescriptive. I think he's laying down the predominant pattern of what the Christian prayer life should look like. One of the marks of an authentic prayer life is simply that it is done mostly in private as we engage our Father one-on-one. To put it stronger, I think one of the marks of a growing faith is that we we do engage God one-on-one. Even if it's just for two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Sometimes we avoid prayer because we feel like, geez, I can't pray for an hour, so I'm just not going to. Pray for two minutes, just to start, get going. Regular, short prayer and build on that. But Jesus wants you to engage him one-on-one because he's your father and we're his children. J.R. Packer says that prayer is the measure of a person spiritually in a way that nothing else is. And I think, I think he's right there because one of the ways you can assess what matters most to you is what you spend your time doing when you're alone. Where do you run when you're alone? When you've got time, where do you run? There, there's lots of great blessings that God has given us, but I think what he's saying is that we would run to him more if we would realize our need, if we would realize his father heart towards us, and if we would realize just how much uh, he wants to hear our prayers and we can run to him. And the more you do it, the more you want to do it. That's the amazing thing about prayer. Communing and communicating with our God. That is the Christian privilege. I'm convinced that this is the secret to extra Christian joy. You show me a Christian who is thriving spiritually and joyful no matter the circumstance and, and just maturing, and 10 times out of 10, there'll be someone with a growing private prayer life. There's just something about it that God uses. So Jesus is encouraging us that our prayer life should be a bit like a, an iceberg We've got the 10% sticking out of the water. That's our public prayer life. But there is so much more prayer going on beneath the surface that we can't even see. I don't know if you're feeling convicted, but I am. I know I don't pray enough. But this is such a a source of, of joy for us. And sometimes we just feel like prayer is too difficult and we can't get there. Friends, do you know what the secret to prayer is? It's very simple. The secret to prayer is secret prayer. The secret to prayer is secret prayer. John Stott talks about shutting the world out and shutting ourselves in with God. You do that regularly enough and you'll start to love it and desire it and hunger for it and find yourself doing it more regularly. But it just starts with the discipline, I think. Look at, look at Jesus. Jesus did this often. If you're, if you're taking notes, write down Luke 5, verses 15 to 16. This is very helpful. It says that the news about Jesus spread all the more so that crowds of people came to him to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. Verse 16, but Jesus withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So Jesus is not neglecting the crowd. He'd get to them later. He'd heal and help, but first he prays. But first, he prays because he knows that before he needs to be used by God, he needs to sink with the heart of God. You and I need the same thing. We need to sink with the heart of God as a first priority in our lives. It's, it's an amazing thing when God uses us. It's encouraging and it builds faith and it's, it's just brilliant to, our, to our, our spiritual walk. But being satisfied in our deepest parts of our heart as we engage with God one-on-one. There is nothing more important for us than that. John Piper says that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And I'm convinced that is the work of prayer. 
It's just satisfaction in God is, is just linked to a, a regular, deep, private prayer life more than anything else. And the final thing Jesus says about an authentic prayer life is simply that it, it needs to be sincere and honest. Look at verse seven and eight. It says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. That phrase there, those two words, empty phrases, do not heap up empty phrases. Some of the Gentiles had a habit of saying lots of words. And Jesus says that saying lots of words, especially when they're very eloquent and, and amazing, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a genuine prayer. He's critiquing it. He's saying that they pray without praying. He's saying that they say lots of words without genuinely meaning the words that they are saying. And so it's empty phrases. Maybe two illustrations that we can probably all connect to. One is saying grace. So the food is ready, you've cooked a good meal, it's been a long day, you're hungry, the food is warm, and now it's time to say grace. Uh, and it better not be long, <laughs> because you're hungry and the food is warm. So you say grace, and depending on your family or context, um, you know, in our culture, there, there's some prayers that are just sort of standard packages, like a little poem sort of thing that you, you can unpack. It, for, for health and strength and daily food, we praise their name, amen. Or for what we are about to receive, make us truly grateful, amen. Or, or whatever it is, there, there's a lot of these recited prayers that we have, that we pull out. And we normally have a rotation of two or three that we can whip out at any moment. But saying them, and I'm not critiquing using those prayers, especially if you're a parent. I think it can be beautiful to, to pray those prayers to just sort of help your kids enter in. Simple prayers that just help them pray and engage with God. It can be beautiful, but how quickly can those prayers just become a rote, routine thing? That we just say the prayer just so we can eat. It's, it's just a formality. We're not really praying. We're just sort of saying it because it's the cultural norm that we have to say a prayer before we eat. How often do we do that? I think that would qualify as an empty phrase. It's not a genuine prayer, it's just a recitation of words. Maybe another example, uh, in, in primary school we had a school song and we had a school prayer. I, I can't remember either of them, but I could recite the school prayer but I can promise you now that I didn't, I never, I don't think I ever prayed the school prayer. I just recited the words of the school prayer. And I think that whether you're reciting something, and I'm not critiquing reciting prayers, I think prayer books um, can be beautiful and so helpful and inspiring and give you words that you don't have. But I think that too often recited prayers take the place of a genuine prayer. It give a, gives us the appearance of praying without genuinely pouring it out there. It, it, it can be praying without praying, it can just be empty phrases. It's, it's saying words without saying, without meaning the words that we're saying. And I think what Jesus is encouraging us here toward is simply this that he wants our prayers to be raw and real and he wants, he's inviting us. This is your privilege if you're a Christian that you get to come to God and spill your guts, as it were. He's not waiting for you to pray this perfect, eloquent, uh, very religious, very polished prayer. He says he knows what you need before you even ask. You don't have to butter him up. You don't have to pray the right thing. He's not waiting for you to say the right thing. That might be what we do when we're in public, but that's, that's what Jesus is criticizing. He just wants us to come to him as our father and pour out our hearts as we cry out to him. He's warning us against using empty phrases and, to, and rather encouraging us to empty our hearts as we pour them out to him in prayer. If you look at 
the context of this right here is that Jesus, when he's talking about this and, he, and he's critiquing, he's confronting fake prayer, he doesn't go to the temple. He goes to the countryside. This is the context of, of the Sermon on the Mount in which the Lord's Prayer is. He's on the countryside. He doesn't go to the professionals. He goes to where the everyday people are because prayer is for everyday people. I think Jesus wants to set us free from this religiosity and, and appearances. He wants to set us free to be able to spill our guts before our Father and to engage with Him in real ways where He gets to really sink with the deep things in our hearts and we get to sink with the deep things in His heart. But that veneer of perfection and trying to get it right and being very religious and saying all the right stuff Jesus says that that can just be hypocritical, it can just be empty phrases. Real prayer is so much more personal and honest and deep. Why does Jesus say he's inviting us into that kind of prayer? It's, it's so amazing. Verse eight, he says, for your father knows what you need even before you ask him. In other words, you don't have to fake it because your father knows what's really going on. He knows the real you. He knows your situation. He knows your life. He knows your job. He knows your marriage. He knows your kids. He knows your singleness. He knows uh, your studies. He knows the desires of your hearts. And most importantly, he knows what you need. And as a good father, as the perfect father, as the all-powerful father, he's working in his grace to give us what we need, to do for us what only he can do, to provide for us in ways that only he can provide. Isn't that encouraging? Just think as we close today, ask this question, how is your prayer life? And is there anything weighing on your heart this morning that you need to pour out to God. I'd encourage you in this moment as we respond to take hold of that. As you pray honest prayers to your Father who loves you. He already knows what you need and he's working in his grace as we cry out to him. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that we can come to you as we are and thank you that we have the privilege of prayer, that even right now we are praying to you, God Almighty, our Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you that we have the privilege just to cry out bad as your children, that you love us and that we get to cry out to you. Thank you that... Um, you love to meet with us and you love to hear the, the prayers of your children. And we just pray now that you would give us the grace of spilling our guts before you and enjoying you, that you'd again fill us with your spirit and with your love and with your grace and meet us in life-transforming ways as we engage you personally. God, we're so thankful for the gospel. Once again, thank you for the cross that you have saved us and made us your own. Thank you that you've made us your children and that you are our Father. Thank you that you know our every need and that we get to lay our hearts down at the feet of our King and our Father and our friend and our Savior, Jesus, knowing that you know what we need and that by your grace you will do all things well and that we can trust you and that we just get the privilege of knowing you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.